Reformation Sunday. <laughs> Rich, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, it's just a glorious, glorious day of worship and praise and joy as we think about our reformed past, uh, as Pete was saying, back through Scotland to Geneva, Switzerland, Martin Luther. There's a rich history and heritage to who we are today. And uh, it's, it's such an encouragement. And we're so glad that we can worship together. Whether you're here in person, way to go, you signed up and you masked up, or whether you're online uh, worshiping with us, way to go, welcome. And please be, uh, if you have any questions, to check with your chat host. I want to ask again today the question, can you believe it and can you be living it? Today we are concluding our series on the Apostles' Creed. We're bringing this worship series about faith to a close. And I hope that this very ancient and very brief statement of faith has been an encouragement for you in this very modern and very challenging year we are in. I hope our talks have been more than just informative lectures as we've really reflected on these parts of the Apostles' Creed. I hope it's a help for you in taking daily steps of faith. And so today we're going to close out the Apostles' Creed with the last phrase of the Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now that's good closure, right? Yeah, what better way to end a statement of faith than that? And by the way, have you ever stopped to appreciate good closure to say a story or a movie uh, have you ever had an experience where the movie ended and you weren't sure that was the ending and you walk out doing this? Um, yeah, we need closure, right? Uh, you know, I, I have a lack of closure joke, but this is great. This is great. Yeah, I used to think I was indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. See, those are superior lack of closure jokes right there. But friends, if you're living your life without a sense of successful closure at some point, that is not a joke. Is there a certain sense of confidence, hope, uh, boldness that you are living your life with? And are you sharing that? Are you counting on great closure, and are you sure enough to be sharing it with others? The Apostle Paul, in the year A.D. 55, wrote a, quite a letter to the Christians who were in Corinth, Greece. And in the first 14 chapters of his letter, he talks about all these ways Christians should live and behave, but as he gets to the end, you can tell he wants to stick the landing. You can tell he wants to end with great closure. And I think Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15 with this phrase from the Apostles' Creed gives us closure that opens up our life. If you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. We also have it projected. Listen to this reading of God's Word. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ Jesus, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, 
most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. God, thank you for this reading of your word. Please. Holy Spirit, help us now. Help me with my words. Help us with our listening to hear your voice and to respond in faith. Amen. Sometime back, I asked my assistant to help me find a void of nothingness. And I remember telling her, you know, just get a, a symbol or a picture of a void or a, a, a vortex, uh, emptiness. Does anybody remember <clears throat> the Domino's ad, Avoid the Noid? Anybody? Thank you. One, yeah, it I, has nothing to do with my message. I just, I'm perturbed that it's stuck in my memory. But um, I told Kathy, my assistant Kathy Lee, to see, you know, see if you can find an image of just nothingness or a void. And um, this is what she ordered for me. I'm going to share it with you today. It's a rug. Right? That's pretty voidy, right? And I, I'm told these are gaining in popularity, these kinds of images and illusions. Uh, you can buy much larger rugs than these. Uh, not on Amazon, not now. Uh, and some people are even having their entire bathrooms tiled with uh, void designs like these. Can you imagine going into your bathroom at night either disoriented or ill? <sighs> right. That's my void of nothingness. And, you know, I, I've had it in my office for a few weeks. And every time I get near it, I, I often think, okay... It's just a rug. <laughs> Step over it. Step on it. And I think it asks the question, what about those moments in your life where it feels like it might drop out from underneath? Can you see where I'm going here? I believe there is a void that looms in human lives. And I think each of us needs to face up to it. I heard a story about a guy who walked by a courtyard and he saw some people uh, in robes making some music and they were kneeling before this altar that had a big banner with a zero on it. And they were singing about the blessed emptiness. And so he asked someone nearby, is nothing sacred? Is nothing zero? Okay. This is a perfect year. This is a perfect year to ask those questions. What is happening to life? And does this mean anything? Is this going anywhere? Is nothing now sacred? This pandemic has uh, promoted physical distancing among us. But are we also distancing ourselves from real hope? Are we distancing ourselves from God and God's truth and hope? You know, I don't know if you remember the phrase that we learned a few weeks back, creation ex nihilo, which means creation out of nothing. Uh, creation out of a void. Right. Some today are positing that nihilism which means a belief in nothing, is on the rise, gaining popularity. Thomas Hibbs has written a book about our popular culture. 
and how nihilism is on the rise, that more people than ever are viewing life as an endless cycle in which life just consists, consists simply of momentary opportunities where you can express yourself or have power over someone. That's it. Secular atheism, which yes, is a redundancy, is also on the rise. Many are actively choosing to reject a life of faith because if you look closely at any world religion, you can spot errors in human judgment, behavior, or ethics. It's true. But is rejecting faith leaving people with anything more than a void of existentialism or nihilism, philosophic nothingness? This morning, the Apostle Paul says to us, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. He's reminding the Christians in Corinth, Greece, about the good news of Jesus because they were becoming disoriented. They, were, they had begun to believe in Jesus. They had begun to seek Jesus. But some were now telling these early first Christians that Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. Some were teaching them that Jesus only appeared uh, after his death, sort of like a vision to an elite few, and that his life force was something you could only perceive. I, we think that this came from the influence of the Jewish Sadducees, who do not believe in life after death, or it might have been from the influence of Greek thinkers who claim that physical matter doesn't really matter, it's the spiritual logic or rationality that counts. So there had begun this confusion in the early church that you didn't really rise to new life after death in Jesus, but that you only lived on as a spiritual spark in the mind of God. And to this, Paul cries, do not be misled. Come back to your senses. He says, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, what does it mean to believe in vain? Well, the key to saving faith is holding firmly to the Jesus good news, persevering with Jesus throughout your life. R.C. Sproul, the teaching theologian who was promoted to glory this year, he was fond to point out that the Bible talks about possession of faith, not just profession of faith. It's in the daily living by faith that demonstrates its real faith and not faith in vain. That's why I like the, the New Revised Standard Version translation at this one point. It translates this sentence as, by this gospel you are being saved. If you're not persevering in and with Jesus in a Christian faith, it can be evidence that you have not had a saving faith to begin with. And this is why I love Paul's words, hold firmly. If you don't mind, can you all just right now make a fist, like a grip with one of your hands? I just want you to feel that strength of holding something firmly. Our puppy, Phoebe, is now four months old. And she's not been through her full cycle of shots yet, so we can't let her out the front door where other dogs might have been for her own safety. And so I know what hold firmly means now. 30 pounds of exuberant, uh, energetic dog. Sometimes I'm holding her in my arms because she wants to bolt out the front door and see what's out there. Hold firmly. Paul is saying... Your faith in Jesus is even more important throughout your life. Saving faith in Jesus means holding firmly to the one who has a forever grip on you. 
Jesus never quit in his mission of love for you. And so our faith is a determination to not quit on Jesus and his call upon your life. Friends, this is how we avoid the void of a pointless, purposeless life, holding firmly to the good news of Jesus, especially in those times when we feel like we're on the brink of nothingness. Let's look at this good news Paul is telling us to hold. First, Jesus really rose. Easter was not invented by Hallmark. I mean, it's true, those chocolate peanut butter eggs. Oh, so good. But no, our belief in the resurrection is based on historical eyewitness. Paul gives quite a list of people here with names. At one point, over 500 who saw and encountered Jesus after he rose from the dead. Please do not allow the years that have transpired or glossy greeting cards or skeptical philosophy of religion professors you had in college to dissuade you or confuse you about this Jesus moment in history being mythic, make-believe, or legendary. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Listen to the Apostles' Creed. He really did suffer under the order and hands of a governor named Pontius Pilate who made sure he was executed. And on the third day, on that third day, the ground began to shake. Roman guards fell over in dead faint. Women went crying. Men disciples went running. And the sun came up. And the son of the living God came up. Hallelujah. I mean, you really want to come at us little Halloween Really, as a Christian standing next to the empty tomb of our Savior, we can just say, bring it. This is the original dead man walking, the corpse of a brutalized, tortured, executed, and confirmed dead man, now animated, alive, shoving back a gravestone slab and walking out of the cemetery. And why? So that we who trust in Jesus can look death in the eye and say, boo. Death, you're now dead to us. Go on, get. Jesus really rose. But let's not forget this next piece. Jesus stayed raised. The Bible uses this passive tense of the verb, he was raised which says to me that Jesus did not raise himself, God raised him. You might say that in the deepest abyss, the void of real death, in the darkness of hell itself, God the Father with the Holy Spirit rose up to raise the Son up. And in this perfect tense of this verb phrase, Jesus stayed raised. Unlike Lazarus, and others who were revived from death by Jesus, and unlike many who have recovered or revived from near-death experiences, Jesus stayed risen. And look at this next piece. Jesus rose even further. After the grave and he rose up, he then later ascended into glory, into the expanse of heaven itself. As the Apostles' Creed declares, he ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Now, how is that good news? It means that Jesus took our human nature into the Godhead and now lives and rules throughout space and time in the universe as God the Almighty interceding for us. And here's more good news. Jesus going up means the Holy Spirit is coming down, empowering, inspiring, guiding us in our adventures today. Jesus' ascension means that when people ask, 
well, where is your Jesus now? We can answer, he's in charge. And his spirit lives with me. I like how a child was once asked what it means that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. And this little girl, I think, got it right. She said it means that Jesus is now God's right-hand man. That works. So friends, the purpose of your life is not nothingness. Your life is not null or void. No. When you consider what the historic Jesus did after being historically executed and then historically ending, finally ending the historic track record of death, life now can become purposeful and hopeful. So I, I do want to ask you today, are, are you feeling like all of this is hopeless? I, I mean, I know 2020 has been a gut punch. It has. Or can you still be hopeful? You see, hopeless is based on human circumstances. But the Christian's hopeful is based on Jesus and what he has done, what he is doing. His victory changes the possibility of human existence from meaninglessness to hopefulness. Sometime back, I saw a guy wearing a t-shirt with a cross on it and the words, this changes everything. And I like it. I believe it's true. But it's only true if you accept the fact, a fact carefully recorded in history, that he rose from the death that came from that cross. Yes, the cross is that profound act of Jesus in obedience to God, enormous sacrifice. But without the resurrection, which leads to the hope of everlasting life, if it was only the cross, we would still be left with a void. Friends, we say and repeat the Apostles' Creed so that we may remember to live the creed. We say it to ourselves because it's a way to hold firmly to our faith. We say it to God as a way of remembrance and an expression of thanksgiving for God giving us this promise. And we can say portions or pieces of the creed to others as a way to share and offer this story of life-saving salvation. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But God's grace to me hasn't been without effect. Right? It's changed me. And he says, this is what we preach. This is what you believed. Are you believing it? Are you living it? Are you at a point where you need to renew your grip on Jesus, who's got you? You know, I believe Jesus' resurrection and life changes this image or feeling of life of a void into something that can be maybe expressed design-wise like this. Now that is a picture, and I'm holding my, <laughs> my little personal portable prayer labyrinth. Uh, usually a prayer labyrinth is, is big on a field or a courtyard, and it's essentially just a little design for prayer. Um, um, it's not a maze. You don't get lost in this. But it's a pathway you can take with twists and turns that go around the center that eventually lead you into the center. And it's been practiced by the Benedictine monks and other Christians for hundreds of years. It's basically a great way to pray for people who can't sit still. And let me share with you... Uh, Instead of walking in a big field or courtyard, uh, you can do this with a little stylus at my desk. Uh, my interpretation of a prayer labyrinth. I think down at the bottom there is the entry point. And for me, that means that first step of faith in Christ, trusting in Jesus. It puts the rest of your life on a solid ground without a pit or a hole. 
And then as you walk and live your life in Jesus, there are turns, decisions, choices you make, people you encounter. There's moments, but, but they're always around Jesus. He's with you. And then there's moments where the path goes directly to the center. I think of those as moments of inspiration or renewal, revival. And then at last, as you keep trusting and walking, you come into the center. And the Benedictines expressed the peace of Christ as a little blooming flower, right? And on this side of heaven, you retrace your steps to go back out as a way to commit to the mission of Christ for others in the world. But friends, one day, one day our steps of faith because of Jesus will take us into the center of his glorious peace, everlasting life. And until that day happens, we go back out into the world. But really, which is better? A life that's taking steps of faith toward Jesus or just living with this. I don't know what you need to do today. Whether it's to re-strengthen your grip of faith in the one who has beaten death. Whether you need to just rejoice in the hope that is within you. Maybe you're at a point of struggle or challenge right now. Where you need to claim Jesus again and rejoice in his love and victory for you. I love this story of a Sunday school teacher at a church who was teaching her children, students in her class, if they understood how it is that we get into heaven. And so she asked her students, she says, now if I sold my house and gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And the kids answered together, no. It's good. She goes, well, what if I cleaned the church every day and then once a month cleaned the outside and the grounds? Would that get me into heaven? And the children said, no, even louder. So she thought she'd really push them. She goes, well, what if I was really kind to animals and always tried to give candy to kids when I saw them? Would that get me into heaven? Kids were a little slower and quieter. No. Now she really pushed them. What if I was so nice I gave you all tickets to Disneyland? Would that get me into heaven? Oh, the kids, they hung in there. No. Now the teacher, she's just brimming with pride at her students and how they got it. So at last she asked, well then how can I get into heaven? And one little five-year-old boy shouted back, you've gotta be dead. <laughs> right. Dead to your own life and your old way of living and alive now in Jesus. Alive now and into everlasting glory. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how we need you each day. And gracious God, you know our tendencies to despair, our struggles, our doubts. Lord, how uh, we forget to walk with you or that you're walking with us. Uh, Jesus, renew our faith today because we're weak. Lord, renew our grip on you. Remind us today and each day to come to hold firmly onto you and to live with that purpose of your mission, to live with that bold peace that with you Nothing can harm us. That with you, we have peace. And show us, Lord, how to live that, speak it, and share it with people around us. Jesus, you've won the victory. Guide us in our victory life with you. Jesus, in your name we pray. 
Amen. Uh, on this day of wrapping up the creed, I'd invite us to say it. Uh, and if you join with me in saying it, we have the modern version here. If you want to say the older version, that's absolutely fine. But I encourage you to say it out loud as an expression of your life and hope. And if you're able and willing, let's stand and say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.